the Sermon on the Mount at the end of chapter um, 5. And uh, it says the following, verse 43 th through to 48. Um, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. God's word to us uh, this morning. So I've had a, um, a question that has been kind of stuck with me during the course of this week. It's, in some, some ways, I guess it's a, a wistful question, you know, the kind of question that makes you just feel on the e inside, oh, oh, I kind of long for that to be the case. Um, in another sense, it's a hopeful question, uh, which kind of paints a picture of a preferred future, and you think, oh, yeah, you know, possibly. Um, it's, it's the question that we, we ask ourselves when we want to try and imagine uh, how things could have been or how things could be. And it's the question, what if? What if? You ever asked yourself this question? What if I don't have another digestive dip biscuit and I do a couch to 5K instead? Um, what if I start reading my Bible just five minutes a day and spending, abiding with Christ in prayer just five minutes a day, and delighting in the Lord for just five minutes a day in worship. What if, what would make, what difference would that make in my life? What if I take this promotion? What if I buy that car? What if I started saving 50 quid a month for the next, I don't know how long, how much, would, you know, what, what, what if? Um, and I was attaching that question to the phrase that of, of Jesus here where he says, uh, well, putting it together like this, what if, what if we took Jesus at his words and we were perfect, therefore, as our heavenly Father is perfect? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, well, that's me out. <laughs> I can just switch off now. I don't need to pay attention because there is, there is just no ways that I will ever get to a point where I can say, you know, I, I am perfect, therefore, as my heavenly Father is perfect. None of this applies to me anymore. And before you check out, before you switch off, just listen a little bit first, right? Okay, so we understand what it is that Jesus is saying in these, these words here. I don't think he's saying, be perfect, be morally perfect. Right, some, some traditions and some denominations have actually taught that, that Jesus, from these verses and others, that Jesus was teaching a kind of sinless perfection, that we could achieve a state in this life where we never tell a lie again, where we never give in to bad anger, where we never look covetously at somebody, where we, where we always keep our word and, and, and that sort of thing. And that, that's not what Jesus was saying. All right? uh, one of the disciples, John, he later on writes and he says, if anybody denies that they have sinned, then the truth is not in them. Uh, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has said that we should hunger and thirst for righteousness. If we go to hunger and thirst for righteousness, then it means that we're, we're not there yet, right? Uh, later on in the, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is going to teach us to do what? Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So the word doesn't mean uh, what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying, hey, be morally perfect. But rather the word is, is a word teleos which basically can be translated as perfect, but can also be translated as mature. And so Jesus is saying, be mature, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, mature, complete, altogether. It's the same word that Jesus, uh, John, James, sorry, <laughs> get there with a J, James, the brother of Jesus, uses when he writes to the church a phrase that maybe you have on your fridge to greet you every Monday morning. It's this one here. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face Monday morning, right? That's not what it says, okay? But when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you can be mature. It's exactly the same word that, that, that Matthew uses, can be teleos, complete, not lacking in anything. 
And Paul writes to the letter to the church in Ephesus, and he, in chapter 4, he talks about the fivefold uh, gifts and ministry gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And he says that, that individuals have been shaped and gifted with these gifts to build up the church that we can attain to unity, all right, and we can grow up in the knowledge of who, who, who God is and who Jesus is, so that we would be mature, teleos, right? And the whole point of it is so that if we're immature, we're not going to be like infants, babies, who are tossed this way and that way by every wind of teaching, but rather we will be mature, all right? We will stand, in a sense, mature. So back to the question then. What if? What if we were mature, therefore, as our Heavenly Father is perfect, complete, mature, lacking in nothing? What if? What if we, we never gave in to bad anger? What if, what if we never looked covetously at others and their things? What if marriages didn't fail? What if we, we always said what we meant and meant what we say? What if we turned the other cheek? What if we did give our cloak? What if we did go the, the extra mile when faced with an evil person? What if we, we did give to those who ask of us? What if we love our enemies? What if we don't go the way that the rabbis in Jesus' time had gone? What if we do something different? What if you don't give in to the teaching? You have heard that it was, oops, one back. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. You know, as, as we've looked at over the past five weeks, you know, each time Jesus is correcting some part of the Old Testament, he's not doing away with the Old Testament and saying, this is unimportant. We don't need to worry about that anymore. He's bringing it front and center again and said, look, you've heard that people have been teaching about the, these, these words, that this is what you do, and, and he hits the refresh button every time. And, and in this occasion, the, uh, the rabbis and the teachers of the law, they had taken uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, which reads, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. They had taken that verse, Leviticus 19, 18, and they had um, taken away from it, and they had added to it, and they had ignored a whole lot of stuff. So as they take that verse, and they just sat in a circle, and they're like, what does this mean exactly? You know, how are we going to live this out? They, they took away from it, they added to it, and they ignored a whole bunch of stuff. They, they took away the all-important qualifier about what how we ought to love other people. They left out the words in their regular teaching, as yourself, which allows us, if we say love your neighbor, it allows us to determine, well, how much I'm going to love them, right? I will love my neighbor exactly as much as he loves me or she loves me. That, that's the distance I'm going to go. And Jesus, well, the original law was saying, no, you need to go further. <laughs> you need to love them the same way that you love yourself. That's how you need to go. So they had taken away, but then they had added in so in Leviticus 19, 18, it says nothing about hating your enemies. But they decided, well, if I'm to love my neighbor, and my neighbor is anybody who's an Israelite, all right, somebody from my family, somebody from my tribe, somebody from my people, okay, those are my neighbors, those are the ones that I need to love, then the flip side of that coin is, well, you must hate your enemy. Right? You, don't, you don't need to love your enemy. And so we, we can hate the Samaritans, and we can hate the Romans, and we can hate anybody who is a, a Gentile. I mean, they even had a prayer. You know, thank God I've been born, born a Jewish man, and I haven't been born a Gentile, was with the way that their prayers used to go. And so they had added this little bit into it. And then at the same time, they were ignoring so much stuff that appears in the Old Testament. There's, there's laws in the Old Testament where Moses handed down to the people and said to them, look, you need to take care of the aliens amongst you. All right? don't, don't treat them harshly. In actual fact, treat them the same way that you would treat a brother. And why? Because you are aliens in Egypt. And don't you remember how it was when other people treated you poorly? So you need to remember that and make sure that you do different to that. That ignored Proverbs uh, 25, where it says, if, if, if your enemy, if your enemy is hungry, not ignore him, <laughs> not make jokes about him or anything like that. If your enemy is hungry, 
feed him. All right? And if your enemy is thirsty, then give him something to drink. They'd taken Leviticus 19, and they'd left stuff out, and they'd added stuff in, and they'd ignored all sorts of stuff. And we could sit here this morning, and hopefully you're not doing this, but uh, we could sit here this morning, and we could think, oh, the cheek of it all, hey? How dare they go and take away from God's Word and add things into God's Word and ignore God's Word? And... But are we not sometimes like that? Where sometimes we can be so zealous and so dogmatic about certain things while ignoring huge swathes of other things in order to uphold the views and opinions that we have on Scripture. And, and Jesus looks at the Pharisees of the day and the rabbis of the day and would look at us and he would say, look, it's not about, you, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But here's what I say to you, love your enemies. Which all, all of a sudden brings into view all sorts of questions for us, right? We, 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 we want to know, like, what, what does this mean exactly? Does this mean, if I'm to love my enemy, does this mean I'm supposed to have a real warmth of affection for them in my heart when I think about them? Does this mean that I need to be friends with them on Facebook and Instagram and share my favorite recipes with them? Does this mean that we're going to text each other regularly and I'm going to invite them to my birthday party and maybe we'll even go on holiday together, right? What does it mean when Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies? And we could turn to three passages. There's probably lots of scriptures we could turn to and lots of stories that we could turn to to get an idea. But I want to just highlight three passages of scripture for you this morning. Scriptures to... Scriptures to get into your head so that they find a way down into your heart, so that they transform your heart, so that they transform your living. Scriptures that you, that, that you can memorize and allow to take root in your heart so it changes the way that you live and perhaps the way that you might engage with those who might be considered your opponent or your persecutor or your enemy. The first one is Romans chapter 12. It's really small. You can just make a note of the, 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 the verse. But Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through to 21, it is just a cracking passage. But it begins with that, that verse, the, those words, love must be sincere. And then following after that, Paul gives, like a, I think it's about 20 little bullet point commands afterwards, right? Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and on and on and on he goes, just kind of unpacking what our love for an enemy might look like. But the verse and all of this that I want to highlight for you, which I think is of the most important, is the one in the middle there. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. This is so important because what usually happens when we're faced with somebody who we might consider our enemy or somebody has hurt us and there's perceived slights and they've opposed us in some sort of way, the natural tendency is to do what? Is to focus on them, <laughs> to think about them, to think of all the different ways in high definition with surround sound that we're going to get them back, right? We're not going to get mad. <laughs> we're just going to get even, all right? And we're going to lick our, our, our wounds and, and focus on these things and just play it over and over and over again in our heads. And that is probably the worst possible thing that we can do. It'll do nothing to bring reconciliation. It'll do nothing to help the peace residing in your heart. And what this verse reminds us is to do is never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. In other words, keep your eyes on Jesus. When you're faced with opponents, enemies that you need to love, don't focus on them. Focus on the Lord. Focus on Jesus, who is the King of love. Focus on Jesus, who is the Prince of peace. Focus on the one who will give you everything that you need for life and godliness. Romans 12, to lift, it lifts our heads in a sense and points us towards Jesus and says, listen, here's where you need to keep your focus. But then you move down to the second verse is the very famous one, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verse 4 to 8, usually a, a passage that is read at uh, uh, weddings and such like things. And 
And this passage, what this passage does is it, it tells us what's in and what's out. It, provi- it gives us the guardrails, if you like. And it says, here's the boundaries. As you seek to love your enemies, here's the things you must do. But outside of this, here's the things that you mustn't do. Here's the things that you need to try and avoid. As you love your enemies, don't envy them. If you think they're getting away with the stuff that you, they have done to you, don't envy them for it. Remember where we finished off last week. We entrust ourselves and we entrust them to God, the judge of all the earth who will do what is right. We don't boast. If something doesn't go their way, right? We don't like, yeah, you deserve that. Okay, you did worse to me and I, I, <laughs> you just got what was coming to you. We're not proud. We're not rude. We're not self-seeking. We're not easily angered. We're not keeping a record of wrongs. How many of you have ever, ever done this, that somebody wrongs you and you're like, oh, it's not the first time. I've got a whole list over here of all the different times that they have done things like this. And you know what? I'm not surprised because that's just what they do, right? We don't do that. That's not the way that we love our enemies. But rather, Jesus would say, be patient. There's something, something great about 1 Corinthians 13. I don't know if you've ever done this, but instead of read the passage and instead of reading it with the word love, read it with the word Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind and so on. It, it, it really is food for the, for the soul. But, but 1 Corinthians 13 tells us here, he, these, are the things that are, these are the things that are in. You must be patient. You must be kind. You must rejoice with the truth, not your version of the truth, but with the scriptures, the truth, all right, and, and, and what God's word says about other people, that they're fearfully and wonderfully made as well, in the image of a holy creator God. We've got to um, protect them, and how would you do that? Well, number one, protect them by not slandering them, telling stories behind their backs as such, we need to trust God. We need to hope for grace. We need to persevere. You're starting to get the picture of what it looks like to love your enemy. The next passage is Luke chapter 6, which is the mirror passage of um, Matthew chapter 5. And here Jesus says similar words. He says, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. So two things that stand out of that. Do good. Serve your enemies. Where the opportunity arises and where it is appropriate, in humility, with sacrificial service, serve those who might be opposing you. And then bless them. All right? Speak well of them. And if you can't find anything well to say of them, don't say anything. Right? Speak well of them. All right? And speak well over them. So you get the picture. I mean, this isn't easy stuff, right? If somebody's dragging your name through the mud and somebody's opposing you and somebody who might, you might think is your enemy and that sort of thing, and Jesus is saying to you here, when, when, when you're faced with somebody like that, serve them if the opportunity arrives. Don't leave the room. Don't ignore them. Don't, don't avoid them. Just serve them if the opportunity arises and it's appropriate. And whatever you say about them in terms of opening your mouth, make sure it is to bless them to build them up. 1 Corinthians 13, Romans 12, Luke 6, they begin to form a picture for us. When we ask this question, what, what does it look like for me to love my enemies? They be, it begins to paint a picture for us of what it might, what it might look like. And it, it, it raises the next question for us, which is why? Why does Jesus tell us to do this? And the answer in the passage is because it's what God does. He loves humankind, every single person sitting in this room and all of those outside. He loves everyone indiscriminately, good or evil. He causes His Son to rise on the good and evil, and He causes His reign to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. We're talking about the doctrine of common grace. The doctrine of common grace says that God causes His favor and His blessing to fall on people regardless of who they are and regardless of what it is that they have done. That the Lord loves all and He is compassionate on all that He 
has made. It doesn't matter if people worship him or not. It doesn't matter if people acknowledge him or not. Every single human being is a recipient of God's common grace. Sun and rain does what for us? It causes crops to grow so that we can eat food. It's common to, to, to all of humankind, right? Uh, the gift of creativity that is given to people who can paint beautiful paintings or write beautiful music, uh, great novels that we can read. Where did that come from? It comes from God. It's a common grace that is given to humanity. Uh, the fact that every human being experiences in a variety of different ways compassion and goodness and, and kindness and the patience of God, it is common grace that is given to all of us. Uh, the restraint of sin in the world. I was thinking during the course of this week, what, what would the world be like if God had to, for just one week, remove His hand of protection and affection from His world? I mean, you think of how depraved and how chaotic life is at the moment, right? That's where it is. God removes His hand of grace from the world for one week, and I think the level is automatically just jumped from there to there in terms of depravity and chaos and confusion. That God, we don't realize it, but God, His presence, the fact that He is in, active in His world, it restrains the sin in the world. Next time you think, how much worse could things get, right? Just here's the answer. If God had to remove Himself for just a moment, you would see how much worse things could get. Technology. Who's got an iPhone? All right? Who's got a Samsung phone? All right? Where did where that come from? It's from people who have been, have enjoy God's common grace that has been given to them so that they can develop technology in, in this way, right? Uh, government, it's, it's a gift from God to humanity. It's all a part of His common grace. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and, and, and on good and His reign to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And then He says to His children, this is what I do and this is what you must do. And Jesus' whole point is like, so what if you love your neighbor? <laughs> you know, anybody can, anybody can love those that they, that they like or who love them. It, what good is it if you love those who love you, Jesus says. You know, even the tax collectors, the most selfish, self-interested, what's-in-it-for-me kind of people that you could possibly imagine, they're doing that. And so what if you walk down the street and you high-five somebody from your tribe? I mean, bully for you. you know? It's just like e even, even the pagans are doing that. And Jesus is saying, I, the whole thing is, verse 47, what more are you doing? He calls us to do more. Remember the whole, the whole thing at the beginning of this section in this here. Jesus said to his followers, your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. Don't just do enough. You, you need to go further. And Jesus' point was that the Pharisees, all of their righteous works were like outward shown and outwardly displayed. But inside, I think later in Matthew's gospel, he likens them. He says, you're like, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs. You look pretty and neat on the outside, but the reality is on the inside, you, you're really full of decay and stinky. And, and Jesus says to us, his followers, he says, you're going to live life in the kingdom? Then I'm calling you to a higher standard because you've been given a new heart and a new spirit has been placed within you and it's been implanted and imputed and engraved with righteousness. And the law of Christ has been written on your heart to love God and to love people. All right? And that law constantly prompts us and prods us with the question, which is this, what, what does love require of me when I'm faced with my enemy? And the answer is, what love requires of us is that we love our enemy. Not, not because they deserve it, not because they've loved us first, not because there's something that we might be able to get out of it. No, we love our enemies because that's what God does, but more importantly, that's what God has done for you. Jesus, the righteous one, comes into the world to reach out his hands to the unrighteous in order to bring us to God. For God so loved the world that He gives His one and only Son, Jesus. And Jesus comes into the world and it, Paul says it's while we were still sinners, while we were still at war with God, while we were still shaking our fist at God and saying, no, no, I know what's best. 
I'm going to do life my way. I'm going to fix up life up my way. Thank you very much. I'm not going to do life your way. You're not going to be the boss of me. I'm going to be the boss of me. At this point, while we were unrighteous and undeserving, at this point, Jesus comes into the world and he lives the perfect life that you, you couldn't live and that I couldn't live. And then he offers his perfect life as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And he bears the penalty for sin, which is death. And he bears the wrath of God against all of our sinful behavior. In order to do what? In order to bring us to God. In order that the way of grace may be opened. That anyone who wants can enter in and put their trust in Jesus Christ, be born again by the Spirit, and acknowledge Him as Savior, and acknowledge Him as their Lord. But the whole point of it is, not everybody does. And God didn't wait until we had got our act together before He sent His Son Jesus. If He was waiting for that, He'd be waiting forever, right? While we were still sinners, God sends His Son into the world to die for you and to die for me. And then Jesus says, you, you want to follow me? This is what it looks like. You need to do the same. You need to love those who oppose you. You need to love your enemies. But it's not easy, is it? It's not, it's not easy. I mean, I, I, I know. <laughs> I know from my own experience. I, I know Romans 12. And I know 1 Corinthians 13. And I know Luke chapter 6. And I can recite parts of these because I have memorized them from time to time. You know, but knowing and doing is not the same thing. You ever notice that? And knowing is easy. Doing is hard. And thank goodness at this point, Jesus doesn't leave us high and dry. He doesn't leave us groping around. All He invites you to do is to make a choice. Because that's what it comes down to. If, if we're going to love our enemies, it comes down to a choice that we will choose to make. And, and the choice is, is a simple one. It's this. Will you pray for them? We, we sometimes think that in order to love my enemy, then I need to live out Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and, and, the, and, and Luke 6. I need to move from where I've just been hurt and offended by somebody who's opposing me to this kind of love. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> right? Remember, the whole goal is, what if we're mature? And maturity doesn't happen overnight. Have you noticed that? I mean, I don't know anybody who planted an apple seed in a pot plant and woke up the next morning and there was an apple tree with fruit hanging from it, right? And we, we don't plant a seed and then wake up the next morning and like, look at the pot plant like, where's the apples, man? Come on, you know. It's, it's a journey. And God invites us to this journey. And the first step on this journey to loving other people is to pray for them, to pray for our enemies. You might not be able to stand in the same room as them yet. You might not be able to do the things that Romans 12 asks us to do or 1 Corinthians 13 asks us to do or Luke 6 asks us to do. You might not be there yet, but where you can be, and it's a choice that you make, is you can pray. You can come before the throne of grace, and you can find help in your time, in your time of need. And you can get down on your knees, and you can begin to pray for the other person. God, smite them. God, no, that's not what we're praying, right? Just come on, right? Not God get them. God, did you see what they did to me? God, can you make sure that you get them back and pay them back double for everything that they've done to me? No, no, no. We're not going to be praying like that, right? You may pray, God save them. But more importantly, could we move ourselves to a place where we pray, God bless them. Bless their families. Bless their relationships. Bless them in their workplace. Bless them when they're driving, when they're going out, when they're coming in. Bless them in, in, in everything that they set their hands to. We, we sometimes stop short of doing this. Do you know why? Because we think to ourselves, well, I've got to wait until I feel that warm, gushy, fuzzy feeling on the inside before I'm actually going to do any of these things. And, and if you're waiting for that, you might be waiting forever. C.S. Lewis and his... Uh, famous book, Mere Christianity, he, he talks about love and he, he makes the point. He says, look, if you don't worry about whether or not you love somebody, okay? 
Just get about loving them. And I'd put in brackets there, just get about praying for them. And you will soon come to discover that you love this person. John Stott, in his commentary on uh, the Sermon on the Mount, he says the following. He says, it's impossible to pray for someone without loving them. It's impossible to, pray, to go on praying for them without discovering that our love for them grows and matures. We must not, therefore, wait before praying for an enemy until we feel some love for them in our hearts. We must begin to pray for them. And before we are conscious of loving them, and we shall find that love breaks into a bud and then finally into a blossom. It works. I know from my own experience it works. It's not easy. It works. It will change you because I think when we, when we pray in this way, we come into the presence of the Prince of Love who, who will go to work in our heart but through His Word and Spirit and change and transform us. And so back to the original question as David and the team come up and just lead us in a time of response and, and worship. Back to the original question, what if? What if we were perfect, therefore, as our Heavenly Father is perfect? What if today you decided in response to the words of Jesus? Think of somebody who's, who's persecuted you. Think of somebody who's opposed you. Think of somebody who, who would fit into the category of being your enemy. What if today we decided, I'm going to start praying for them? I'm going to pray that God blesses them. God prospers them. God favors them. And as God does all of this, He does something in my heart at the same time. What difference would it make in your life in terms of the peace that you might encounter? What difference might it make in, the, in, your, family's, in your family's life? What difference might it make in the, the everyday normal place where God has placed you if you loved like that? I think the answer is it would make all the difference. And we would discover that it has only ever been for our good because God wants what's good for us. But most especially, oh, it will be for His glory. And that's not a bad thing.